remember that to be commutative is just to say that the composition of the morphism should be exactly what uh, we expect. So in other words, that going D direction and then following by this direction is the same as going directly from this direction. So after composition, so is the, what I want. Okay. So anyway, so um, the universal property that this object, the this projective limit. So in general, this projective limit is, is not only the object, is the object together with these morphisms, uh, phi i, but usually we, when we talk about projective limit, we just think, uh, uh, as we just think in the object, uh, which is not very good because this comes with the morphisms phi i, but uh, sometimes it, it is called the projective limit we call the projective limit just the object, but implicitly we have to remember the object of that the morphisms that comes with this with this object. So the universal properties as follows. Let's suppose that we have B and another object in the category, together with morphism now psi i from this new object B to a i for every i in the index and index set. And then um, such that we have uh, this property also. So we have uh, this diagram like that, and we have that this diagram is commutative with the phi i's that comes with the, with the, with the projective system, okay? So this, these are the new objects from B to a i. We have this to be a commutative diagram for every i. Let's circle like this. Then there exists a unique, this is the universal property, there exists a unique phi from B to A, in which A is, uh, uh, I call A the projective system. So, uh, uh, sorry, I call A the projective limit. A is the projective limit. So there exists a phi such that this diagram is commutative. This is the, the, the diagram that I already have. But remember that I have another diagram with with the A, which is the projective limit. And then I have the morphisms that comes with this A, the phi I, phi J. And here I have a lot of triangles. And I ask that each one of these triangles is commutative. So the whole diagram is commutative. And once again, this means, for instance, that if I do the composition of five uh, with phi I, so I go, I go from this direction to here. I, what I get is the, the, the CJ, right? Or CI in this case, I get I wrote it wrong. Yeah, this is CI here. This is CJ. So this is a mistake on my notation, but, but the idea is this one. So if I go this direction and I go back and go down, this is the same as, as going directly from here. So in other words, uh, what we are saying in a categorical sense is that the projective limit is a cone, but this is a universal cone. It's a final object like in the category of cones. In other words, this projective limit is, what, is a categorical limit, but this is just in, in the case you know these this categorical uh, definitions. But um, this is some, somehow a little bit confusing the first time you see it because a limit in a categorical sense is an inverse limit with this definition or a projective limit. But okay, once we understand these differences, I think everything is clear. So uh, the nice thing about uh, the definition that I give is that we have an explicit construction and then this explicit construction in all these nice categories that we are working always exists. Uh, the, the point is that in some other not so nice categories, I can define this, uh, this projective limit or this categorical limit only by the universal property. And then later we have to prove if this is the case that the limit exists. But then in these nice categories, we always have these projective limits or these categorical limits. So we are happy. And we are considering that we have everything in my categories to guarantee the existence of these limits. Okay. So as it's going to be the case 
in the in the category categories we will work with. Okay, so this is the condition of commutativity. So let's start with the first examples. Of course, we have a lot of examples that appear in in these uh, the Galois representations, and in particular. Uh, this example appears a lot when we construct these Fontaine rings. So that's why we are studying this. And big oh, big also because we want to understand the topological, uh, the topological structure of my Galois groups, uh, these uh, periodic numbers also. So, so consider that A is the category of topological spaces. So in this case, the projective limit, once I have a, a projective system, is a topological space. So that's good. And then I have that the transition for functions are continuous functions because these are the morphisms in the category of topological spaces. The morphisms are continuous functions. And then also the, the canonical map say from, from the projective limit to each one of the XIs is a continuous function. So this is what we have. So if F, every XI is a finite set, then we can uh, endow every XI with a discrete topology. Then uh, we have uh, XI at, X, every XI a topological space with a discrete topological space. Then in this case, we call the projective limit as uh, it is called a profinite set. So it's a profinite set because this is the projective limit of finite sets. So, so it's like a short word to say all of that. So this is very important because uh, in this case, we have that the product, since every finite set with the discrete topology is compact, then the product is also compact. And then uh, the limit is in fact a closed subset. Right? The, the condition that define the, the projective limit as I constructed is a closed condition. You can prove that this limit is a closed subset of this compact space. Therefore, uh, therefore this is also compact. And I, and I led you this as an exercise. Uh, which is uh, very interesting. So X is also compact. And uh, moreover, by the conditions, because this is a finite set and because of the product topology, you can prove also that this is compact and totally disconnected. So it, it is related, with, you know, the definition of compact and totally disconnected because Miriam today morning, she was working exactly with these concepts, okay? So this is very interesting because it tells me that always when I construct a topological space as a projective limit of a discrete and, and finite sets, we get a topological space which is compact and totally disconnected. And in fact, there are some characterizations of this compact and totally disconnected, set, disconnected sets, which is related exactly with these projective limits. Okay, so we continue. Now, what about if we consider not only the category of topological spaces, but the category of topological groups? And then Miriam also talked today about these topological groups. So XI is a, is a group together with a topology in such a way that the operations of group, like namely the multiplication and, and the inverse, uh, are continuous. Okay. So in this case, uh, the transition on homomorphism are the transition morphism are homomorphisms, and they are continuous. And then uh, also the say the canonical morphisms to every x i is a homomorphism, and these are continuous because these are once again the morphisms in the category of topological groups. And then in this case, we have once again that if x i Every XI is a finite group with a discrete topology. We can endow it with a discrete topology. And in this case, we have more than a profinite set. Now this is called a profinite group. Okay, so this is very important kind of examples that uh, appears a lot in this theory, these profinite groups, as we are going to see. So once again, these profinite groups are group which are compact and totally disconnected. 
is just by the construction. And then we have a very nice exercise with this theory of topological groups on, or this theory of profinite groups. For example, that all open subgroups of, of a profinite group are closed. That a closed subgroup is open if and only if it is a finite, finite index. These are exercises. In fact, they are not very difficult exercises. We can discuss or you can try to solve them. Can we discuss your solutions in the exercise session? Uh, now, more concrete examples. We are going to take the natural, the natural numbers starting in one as, as the index set. And then uh, we are considering the category of topological rings. And we are choosing a family of topological rings, which are the, the, the integer small n. So this is a very number theoretic example. So uh, with a discrete topology, right? So they are rings with a topology, which is a discrete topology. We can prove that in fact, the operations of rings are continuous with this discrete topology, of course. Don't, then I have to, to say which one is the order in, in I. So the order is not the usual order. We are, we are going to say that n is less to equal than m if and only if n divides m. So this is the order I'm giving to the naturals. And then you can, you can see, you can easily prove that with this order and these morphisms, which are the natural projections from C mod m to C mod n, we get a projective system. And since we get a projective system, we can consider the projective limit. And then I put a, a, a star in this limit just to, to indicate that the order we are using here is not the usual order, but the order given, given by division. Okay, so in this case, this ring is very important. That have, we have a, a notation for this. This is set a hat. This is the completion. This is also like a completion in the sense that um, that uh, medium talked talk to us today in the morning, and this is a complete ring. Um, we will see the, this in a second also. That is called uh, the profinite integers, because this is a profinite completion of, uh, of the, the integers. OK. So an important example also that uh, is very related with this one is when we consider only some in some natural numbers and the non-natural numbers that we consider now is the, the powers of a prime number. I fix a prime number and I consider only the powers of a prime numbers. And then I consider only the, the sets that the, in the case in which N is exactly one of these powers of these numbers. So I can get I get also a projective system and then I consider the limit. And in this case, what I get is a ring that we denote by CL. And this ring is called the ring of Pedic. The, uh, the ring of Pedic of Eliadic integers. Eliadic because L is a prime number. And then this is a, a topological ring. You know, this is also a profinite, profinite ring. And moreover, this is a, a pro P, pro, pro L ring. It is more than a profinite ring because now the, the groups are not only finite groups, but they are also a, a L groups so in the sense of P groups. So the order is a power of a prime number. So this is a pro L group topological, which is a topological ring. And then uh, you may wonder if you don't know that why we denote it, it exactly in the same way as the pedic numbers, just we are changing just P by L. Uh, well, the reason is because they are isomorphic. This is another construction of the pedic numbers. We say that the construction that Miriam gave, gave us in the, in the morning or in the past lectures is like the analytical construction of 
of the theadic numbers or Eleatic numbers. And what, I, what I'm presenting here as an example of all these projective limits is the algebraic construction. And of course, uh, uh, exercise is to prove that these two uh, rings are the same, but uh, we, we, we can do that later, but we have to consider a little bit more properties that we have for this field. So one of these properties is that CL is a complete discrete valuation ring with a unique maximal ideal, and the unique maximal ideal is uh, generated by the prime L. In other words, is a, is a multiplication by L, uh, whose residue field is exactly the final field. So you recognize that this is exactly what happens with the ring that Miriam defined us in the morning. Moreover, I can say that the fraction, this is a, this is a, a discrete valuation ring, so this is a domain. So we have a fraction field and the fraction field is the field of fractional numbers. So this is once again, another, con another way to construct the, the theadic rational numbers or Eleadic in this case, because we are just taking L, L, L may be P, so L is any prime number. So this is an algebraic way to construct the theadic numbers. And this is a nice example of these projective limits. So the advantage of this construction is that we have a topology already, the, the topology given by this projective limit. Uh, and we know that it's a profinite, they are profinite uh, topological groups. And therefore they are totally disconnected and, and we have all these properties. So an interesting uh, way to see this is also that this QL is the localization of CL in, in the prime L which is uh, exactly the same as just inverting the prime number L in CL and can be seen as the union of, uh, of this, uh, say, of these balls, they are balls. Uh, so the multiplication of L to the minus M to CL. So this can be seen as, as this union. Okay, so this is, oh, I, I guess, um, Miriam talked about this a little bit uh, more. She, uh, she presented it more like in analytic way, but if you think a little bit, you see that this is exactly the same, right? These are the balls of certain radius. So, so which one is the radius? So this is a question, but they are like balls, okay? So uh, we have a nice relation between these two rings. And then we have that the profinite integer, this set hat, is just the product of these um, the rings of theadic or Eleadic numbers when L varies all prime numbers. So, and then this is exactly an, an application of the Chinese remainder theorem. So this is part of- uh, Rogelio, yes. excuse me, there, there is a comment in the chat. I don't know if you want to address it. It's uh, Juan Valdez. He said, with medium short sequence, we can use the five lemma given the right map. He believes. With William, you want to comment? We can use the five lemma given the right map. I believe. I I don't know what I don't know what is he talking about. Sorry. So maybe this is a good question for the. Uh, I mean, I know the five lemma and everything, but uh, I don't see the short exact sequence of Miriam. Okay, so maybe we can discuss it later so yes okay so i'm not talking about it right now so okay so um, yes we get this uh, using the change remainder theorem as i was saying this is just an application and then another source of examples are Galois groups and then for Galois groups uh, we need to consider k a field and L over K, a Galois extension of my field. So is uh, any field, any Galois extension, okay? So uh, we know that the Galois group of L over K is a set of, uh, of more, uh, homomorphism of fields from L to L in such a way that uh, when we apply this homomorphism to, L, to the elements of X, they remain fixed, so they, they act as the identity in the elements of K. So this uh, group of uh, automorphism over K, so this gamma group, 
Now this is a color extension, so we call it a color group. It is very important. And then now once, once we have this Galois extension, this Galois group, we can consider the set A, which is the set of all the Galois extensions of K inside L. And not only Galois extensions, but extensions of finite degrees, so finite Galois extensions of K inside L. So this is a, a, a set, and this will be in my index set uh, because I want to construct a, a, a a projective system, and then I'm going to use this as, a, as an index set. We can, you can verify that it works as a, as a directed set, right? So this is an exercise in Galois theory to see that, in fact, we have, this is a, a directed, directed set. So of course, I have to say which one is the order, and the order is by contention. So A1 is less or equal than A2, if and only if A1 is a subset or a subfield of A2. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the exercise. A, A is a direct set. And then uh, you can also verify that, in fact, L is the union of this finite Galois extension. This is also a result of Galois theory, right? Classical Galois theory, you can verify this very easily. So every Galois extension is the union of their finite Galois extensions, right? So extensions. Okay. So then we can consider the set of Galois groups A over K for A in this family. So intermediate Galois extensions, finite intermediate Galois extension. So you can easily verify that this is a projective system. And so this is a projective system so we can consider the Galois groups. Of course, I have to I have to say which one are the the morphism for the projective system and the morphism for the projective system are like this. Always when I have a, mm -hmm. a finite extension in A or an extension like this in A, we have a morphism from the Galois groups in the reverse order, like that. So with this morphism, uh, the, is the restriction, of course. And with these morphisms, we get a projective system. And then we can consider the projective limit of the system. So once again, I write the definition. This projective system is the sequence, sequences of automorphisms of, of, uh, uh, of these groups, such that when we restrict, when we restrict these morphisms to, to the base field, we get uh, not the base field. We restrict the morphism, one morphism here to this field, it's not the base field, but the subfield, we get exactly the entry that corresponds to, to this E, right? Okay. So then uh, we have the Galois group of L over K, and then we have this projective limit. And, and this is very easy to see that we have an homomorphism of group of groups from this Galois group G, this projective limit, which just consists of taking uh, the restriction of G. Once I have a, a, an automorphism of L fixing K, we restrict this automorphism to every E in the family. And then I, I get my compatible sequence. You can verify easily that this is a compatible sequence in here. And of course, this is an homomorphism of groups. But it turns out that this is more than an homomorphism of groups. Since these extensions are finite extensions, you know that these Galois groups are finite groups. And therefore, this one is a projective limit of finite groups. So this is a profinite group. OK, so it's a profinite group. It comes with a topology, so the topology that is a Topology that makes it a profinite group that is called the Krull topology. And then um, the interesting thing is that, uh, uh, in fact, this map is an isomorphism, which means that, in fact, this group, this Galois group, is a profinite group. Because once we identify this with, the, with this projective limit, so we are seeing that every Galois group is a profinite group. Okay. So it comes with a topology, the topology given exactly by this projective limit. 
So, okay, so it's a profinite group and therefore it is compact and totally disconnected. Okay. And as I said, the topology here is called the cruel topology. So this is very very interesting because now my Galois theory, uh, I mean, these, oh, these Galois groups are not only groups, are topological groups. Therefore, I can use all the, the theory of topological groups applied to these very interesting groups that appears in number theory. And of course, in the applications. So for instance, we have the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. And this fundamental theory, Galois theory works for every uh, Galois extension, not only finite extension, for every Galois extension, infinite Galois extensions. And then uh, this is the, the theorem. So there is a one to one correspondence between intermediate fields, extensions of, of a fixed field K, say. And I have K and L fixed. So K or L is a Galois extension of K. So we are looking to the intermediate extensions of K, not necessarily Galois, so just the intermediate field extensions. And now I, I look at the class of groups of the Galois group, okay? So we have these two worlds, like um, the intermediate fields from one side, and from the other side, I have the class of groups of the Galois group of L over K. So, then I can take an intermediate intermediate field and I can consider the Galois group of L over K prime, K prime. Then this is a subgroup of the Galois group here. Okay, it's a subgroup of the Galois group and it turns out to be a closed subgroup. Okay. And then uh, going back, I have the classical situation. So I, I take now a subgroup, a subgroup here, and then I can consider what is called the fixed field of this subgroup, which is just the all the elements X in L, such that when we apply the automorphism or the morphism to J in this X or J in H, in H I get a trivial action. So this is like uh, the identity for every X of the X. So I, I consider the elements on X uh, in this way, okay? So it turns out to be a field, and in fact, to be an intermediate field. And then uh, this theorem is telling me that this, are, this is a bijection. And then this is an anti-bijection in the sense that it reverses contentions. So it preserves contentions, but it reverses the contentions, okay? So uh, moreover, it respects finite extension. So we have all, all kind of, of uh, objects that are respected by this bijection. So, if I consider finite extensions, it turns out that the corresponding objects are open subgroups. If I can consider finite Galois extensions, then the corresponding objects are open normal subgroups. And if I can consider Galois extensions, any Galois extension, so what I get is closed normal subgroups. And in the, and in the other way, of course, right, because it's a bijection. Say, you see, if I get this group H a closed normal subgroup, then I guarantee that the fixed field will be a Galois extension. Okay. So we have um, this corresponding, which is a very nice correspondence. And then you see that this uh, uses this topology of my Galois group. So this is a theorem uh, which is important because we have a cruel topology. Some, some students ask, today morning why we consider cruel topology. And well, I, I, I mean, this is a natural topology for local, for these spaces. And then we can have these nice theorems. For example, when we consider this topology, this topology coming from the projective limit. Okay. This may be a reason, okay. So, and now uh, let's consider a very particular example that is very useful to, to do some definitions also. So we consider K be a finite field. So you know that finite fields have uh, with Q elements, this Q have to be a, a power of a, of a prime number. So Q is just a power of a prime number. 
and then we fix an algebraic closure of, of my field. Then now we consider the absolute Galois group of this finite field. So we would like to understand the absolute Galois group, and then we have now a tool to understand it because uh, we know that this is a projective limit. So we just want to describe which, which one is the projective limit explicitly. So for every n, so these are finite fields. So you know that there exists a unique finite extension of degree n of kn. So this is uh, uh, this is very easy to construct this finite extension. So you have the field of qn elements, and then um, this is this is only one of these extension inside the algebraic closure, right? There's a unique extension of this way with qn elements in the algebraic closure, or a unique extension of degree n of k inside the algebraic closure. This is a, a theorem, finite field theory. So uh, moreover, we know that this extension is cyclic, and therefore the Galois group uh, of this finite extension is a cyclic group. And then the cyclic group, in fact, is isomorphic to the, to the integers, integers model mod n. So this is very helpful because then this Galois group should be generated by one orthomorphism, phi n. And then uh, this orthomorphism is uh, just taking the powers of, of the cardinality of the base field. So it's the, what, what is called the, the Frobenius or the arithmetic Frobenius automorphism. So the Galois group is a cyclic group, group generated by the Frobenius automorphism. So, but do you know that this Galois group should be the projective limit, right, of the finite Galois extensions, because all of these are all the Galois extensions, they are finite Galois extensions. So you know that you have an isomorphism of this uh, Galois group. This J is now the, the absolute Galois group, I set it here. Uh, we have this projective limit, okay? So this is a profinite group, but we know that these groups are isomorphic to C mod NC. So the projective limits are isomorphic, of course. So these groups is the, the projective limit. And as we have seen, this projective limit is the completion of the integer, so the profinite integer here. Therefore, these two groups are isomorphic. So we have an isomorphic. So this is a very explicit situation. This is a, a solution of in this case, of course, a solution of the inverse Galois uh, problem, right? So given a group, we wonder if this group is a Galois group. So in this case, we have seen that given this group, this group is in fact a Galois group and we said explicitly which Galois group it is, okay? So um, this is very nice. So, since we have a topology, then, then we say that G is isomorphic to this Galois group, which is topologically generated by, by this uh, Frobenius automorphism. So, so once again, uh, remember that I have this automorphism phi x, which is x to the power q. Uh, and then this automorphism is a topological generator of my Galois group. It, uh, this Galois group is not cyclic, but this pro-cyclic, and this is another definition, right? So now this is a this is a profinite limit, or this is a limit, not only of finite group but of cyclic groups. Yeah, right. This is more than finite; they are cyclic groups. And then this is a pro-cyclic -cy pro uh, group, pro-cyclic -pro limit, and then. Um, this is um, not cyclic, but pro-cyclic, pro pro-cyclic. And then uh, the, the generator or topological generator is this, uh, this Frobenius automorphism. And then exactly what we mean is if we take any element in the, in the Galois group, and this is not, this element is not a power of uh, an, an, an integer power of the, of the, of the Frobenius, but it's a padic power of the Frobenius, right? It's like there is a padic, not a padic, uh, this not padic, I said this uh, uh, complete integer, like an element of the 
completion of the integer, so this profinite inter integer, uh, such that phi to the power e is exactly this. So of course, we have to interpret correctly this, what is the meaning of phi to the power e, but uh, you can imagine, right? Like you can realize it like as, as a limit. Or in other words, every element in G can be fine as a limit of, uh, of powers of the, of the, of the Frobenius. Uh, uh, Rogelio, there's a couple of questions uh, or comments that there are in the chat. Maybe you want to address it? Yes, yes especially the ones of, of Kent's is a, is a nice answer. So we get it by phi is dense, of course. This is this is this is what I was explaining right now, right? That every element there is a limit of the powers of the Frobenius. Well, this is exactly this is exactly the, the, the definition. And and dense with the topology of the profile topology, and this is exactly uh, what I mean with this, right? So phi to the a, so it may be uh, understood as a limit, but that's uh, not a uh, I mean, the limit is with this topology. It's a limit with elements in here. So this element is a limit. So that gives me a sequence. So the compatible sequence that defines this object gives me a, a sequence here. And then and this is exactly what we mean. This, this is like, say, the limit of this situation. So of course, this is the subgroup generated by phi is dense. Exactly. The closure of this subgroup is the, the full space. Okay. Every length of J is a limit. Okay. Uh, what does it mean to be topologically generated by phi? This is the answer. Okay, good. Okay, now we continue. Uh, and then this element phi, which corresponds to a sequence, to this sequence, if you understand this phi as, as the sequence of the Frobenius. Is called the arithmetic Frobenius. Okay, and then we call the we put this name arithmetic because we have another Frobenius. So we consider the inverse of this. This is called the geometric Frobenius. Okay, okay, and then if k in my base field is the finite field, is the prime field, then this arithmetic Frobenius is just called the absolute, the absolute Frobenius. Okay. So uh, you may wonder why this difference we can, between arithmetic and geometric Frobenius, and of, of course the difference is clear. They are all automorphism. They then you have the inverse. But why arithmetic and why geometric? And uh, very fast, I can tell you that of course the arithmetic Frobenius is because this is the 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 Frobenius coming in from the arithmetic, so from the finite fields. And the geometric Frobenius is the inverse. And the reason is because when we extend this, this Frobenius to, to the geometry, and in particular, when we can extend it to the cohomology, in particular to the etal cohomology. So the, you know that when you do these extensions to cohomology, are all reverse. And, and then when we get, we, when we consider the Frobenius in the etal cohomology, we would like it to be in the right direction. And then there, it turns out that the, the Frobenius that, uh, that we get from the right, in the right direction when we extend it to the cohomology is coming from this one. So that's why this is called the geometric Frobenius, etal cohomology, and then that's the reason, basically. Okay. So that's it. And then, so the, the absolute Frobenius is often denoted just by sigma, by the letter sigma, not by phi. Okay. So if I have any field of characteristic P, then we can also consider this endomorphism from K to K, uh, sending X to the X to the power P. And, and this is also called the absolute Frobenius, okay? And it's just referring that we are taking P equal to the characteristic, okay? So, but it may not be an automorphism, right? So it's, in general, this is just an endomorphism. And then when, when uh, I have a field of characteristic P, we go under C, we say that this field is perfect if 
exactly exactly when this sigma is an automorphism. This is a proposition that you, there's a, some equivalent relation, equivalent definition for a perfect field. But in the case of characteristic P, bigger than zero, this is equivalent to saying that the Frobenius is an automorphism. So this is a very easy definition, like for, for uh, perfect fields. So if it is perfect, a field of characteristic P is positive. Uh, Rogelio, I, I think this is a good time to take a, a small break. Oh, really? Oh, it was really fast. OK, I have to go faster. Good, so we take 10 minutes. OK. So thank you once again. So we continue with this. Uh, OK, so we continue. Uh, just uh, um, something that I wanted to say last time. So some of the difference of R and QP and C and CP that I didn't mention, but which are, of course, uh, clear now, just to, to point them. We have this diagram of the completion of the rational in these two different worlds, like the Archimedean and non-Archimedean world. And we get the rationals, and we said that this was more or less equivalent to, to the pedic uh, rational, the reals and the pedic rationals, and then the complex numbers, more or less equivalent to the pedic complex numbers, which is the completion. But one of the differences we have here is, of course, that the degree of these extensions are different, right? So the, the degree of the extension here is two, and here the degree is in an infinite extension. So uh, this is also a, a huge difference. And then yesterday, someone uh, asked if uh, what happens if we start with the rational numbers, and then we consider the algebraic closure of the rational numbers first, and then we take the completion of the algebraic closure of the rational numbers, uh, wondering what we get. So in some, some sense, he's inverting this process. Like uh, we start with the rational numbers, we take the algebraic closure of the rational numbers, and then we complete. And then the answer is that we get, once again, the, the complex periodic numbers. And then this is a result that, I mean, more or less the argument for that is that if I take a finite extension of the rational number, I mean, a number field, and I can complete it uh, using a place above the prime number or above the L of the prime number, then what I get is, uh, is a complete field, which returns out to be a, an extension of QP. So if I start with a finite extension of the rational numbers and I complete it uh, with a place above, above my prime number, I get a finite extension of QP. That may be QP, is not, uh, the degree is not respected, but I have a finite extension of QP, therefore an algebraic extension. And if I do this for all the algebraic extensions, for the finite algebraic extension, I get here, finite algebraic extensions of QP. Therefore, you can see that the, when do, I do it for the algebraic closure of the rationals, we get uh, this inside, uh, uh, like this inside the algebraic closure of QP. So I get this, these fields inside C. So the completion of the algebraic closure will be inside this algebraic closure of the periodic rationals. And then just by an argument of now of the completions, because we have, now the, the completion of the algebraic closure is a complete field uh, containing these periodic uh, or these rationals. With this valuation, we, we can show that the other contention also happens. And then we have that these two fields will be equal. So the periodic, the periodic complex uh, can be constructed in, the, in, the, in this other way. So basically we have the same. I, I hope this, um, answer more or less this question, uh, but at least you have the idea So why this happened. So um, also uh, I said that the color group of, of, the, of the complex numbers or the real, Russian of the reals have only two elements. And then uh, I wonder how was this color group? But then, of course, now we just studied how these gamma groups are. We already know that this is a profinite group. And then, since this is a profinite group, we have a lot of information. But uh, still, uh, even if I have all this information, it is still not very clear how is this group. So we still need to understand it better. 
So one of the things that we said, uh, and, and which is related with the idea of this course of studying the color representation is that the cohomology groups, the etal cohomology groups, uh, want to extend, extend the scalar of a variety over the algebraic closure of my field K with coefficient QP are representations of this absolute Galois group. And then uh, they are therefore paddic Galois representations. So, so, okay, so understanding this, this uh, action of this Galois group here is very important. So for the geometric characteristics we wanted to study yesterday or, or that I showed. So, but I also mentioned that these uh, Galois groups can be realized uh, subgroups of the absolute Galois group of the rationals. So is, is this in the same like uh, the same uh, uh, mood of the, que of the question they, they did yesterday? Is that uh, if now I consider the Galois group, or the absolute Galois group of the rationals, so I consider the, the algebraic closure of the rational and, and the rational numbers, then and now I can take a prime number L and then I can. Uh, Take L up be a place or above L. This is just, you know, that um, you don't know what this is of a place. So I consider all the evaluations that I have in my field in, in the algebraic closure. And then uh, these valuations, when I restrict it to, to the rational, are one of those uh, paddic valuations or this infinite valuation, so the visual absolute value, say. So they are all the options. This is part of the Ostrowski theorem, right? like uh, uh, Miriam talked today, yesterday. So saying that, uh, so uh, two valuations are equivalent, we have a notion of equivalence and, and a class of equivalence valuation is this, this place. And then to be, uh, they are equivalent if they are, they live over the same prime. So if they are equivalent, they live over the same prime. And then, and then um, this is a place basically above L. And then this is equivalent to choose an embedding to, to an algebraic, to the completion, say so to the completion. But, but well, the important thing is that uh, once I have a place like that, I can consider the composition group of the place, which is the set of all the Gs in the absolute Galois groups, such that they fix the place. So the, 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 it's invariant the action of the group under this place or this valuation is invariant. This is called the decomposition group of lambda. And if I have another place above L, then these two groups are uh, conjugate, are conjugated. And then uh, we can uh, uh, therefore choose like a, a representative or the class or a class of this, of this, um, of this group up to conjugation. And we denote it by DL. So this, this is just taking one representative of the class. And then it turns out that we have this isomorphism between DL and the absolute Galois group over, over QL, over the Padix number. So in this, in this way, these this Padix Galois groups or Eliadic Galois groups are uh, subgroups of the absolute Galois group. And then there's a nice theorem that's saying that in, if we want to, to investigate these Galois representations of the absolute Galois group of the rational, we can in fact do it through these uh, decomposition groups. We don't we, we get uh, a lot of information from these decomposition groups. So um, this is a good idea if we are just interested in studying Galois rep representation of the absolute Galois group of the rationals. Uh, to study these paddic or Eleadic representations and of course paddic representations. So the difference between paddic and Eleadic representation, I'm going to talk about this later, but yesterday I also told you something like uh, when I have a, a field, uh, do you remember that's the paddic numbers, if I have a, a pad, the paddic numbers with P a prime, I have the ring of integers of the paddic numbers, which is CP, and then uh, when I consider the residue field, I'm going to talk about that just in a minute, but when I consider the residue field, this is a field of characteristic P, although the, the periodic number is a field of characteristic zero. So I can consider F primes numbers L different from P, and then I get 
teleadic representation, but when I consider uh, L equals to P in this situation, I get teadic representations. And then, uh, although we have some similarities, the situation is different. Some problems in the topologies that I present you now. And then, uh, then the theory of eliadic representation and pedic representations are different, although with some similarities. And we agree that the pedic uh, pedic uh, representation are a little bit more difficult. So we are going to see an idea at least why this, we say that they are more difficult. But we have a lot of a structure and very interesting problems in this in this theory. Okay, so this is just uh, like a parenthesis of uh, what we said. Yesterday, that I think is useful for everyone, not only for the people who is coming to, to the exercise session. But I want to clarify, and I put it this here because precisely we are studying these Galois groups, on these absolute Galois groups. And this gives also a motivation why I study this, exactly this uh, pair of Galois groups, right? Okay, uh, now we pass very fast to a review of local fields. So, because they are also very important. So, I, I would like to define precisely what is a paddock field. So, but then, then let's start with local field. So, we consider A, B a ring, and then we are considering an evaluation of this ring exactly as, as Miriam told us. So, this is the same definition, but just for, for any ring. This is not necessary for a field. So, evaluation is a function with all these properties, exactly the properties that we expect. So we have some trivial evaluations. Uh, I say if, the, if there exists a, a number or an element a in a such that so that the evaluation of this element is not zero nor infinity, then we say that my evaluation is non-trivial. Then of course I, I have the notion of trivial evaluation if every element is zero or infinity, of course. Then um, we are considering in general non-trivial evaluations, although for example, for, for this theory of Berkovich spaces that we are going to study also in this school, this is important. But then, um, so this theory of evaluation is very important for this uh, Berkovich spaces. So, so evaluation defines an absolute value as we see in general with, with medium, not only in periodic numbers, but in fact, in any ring, say, with this evaluation. And then you imagine what are the properties of this absolute value. This is the properties that we can deduce from, from the properties of the evaluation, the equivalent properties. Uh, and then in fact, when we have an absolute value, we can endow my ring with a topology, the topology given by, by the distance that we can construct with this absolute value. That can this topology can be also expressed only in terms of devaluation. The so, and then it turns out that this topology makes my ring a topological ring. So, which means that operations in the operations of the ring are continuous. And then, in fact, we can explicitly say which one are the neighborhoods of the of the zero in in both situations, like in the in the evaluation smooth, say. So this. We vary in all the all the ends. We get an, a base of neighborhood of the origin or of zero, which in terms of absolute values can be expressed also like these are the balls around zero, right? So you see that with Miriam in the case of periodic numbers, but this is a general thing that happens for for these kind of rings with, with evaluation. So an interesting property is that always when I have a ring with evaluation, then this is a domain. And since this is a domain, you can easily prove that it's a domain, then you can consider the fraction field. Then if, once I have the fraction field, I can extend the evaluation of this ring to all the, to all the fraction field. And then the definition is exactly as we do with periodic numbers. So the evaluation of A over B is just the evaluation of A minus the evaluation of B. So, uh, so once we have this uh, ring with evaluation, then we can define the ring of integers of my, of my field, just as a set of all the elements in cases that they, we have positive evaluation or zero, the B of A is greater or equal than zero. This is a very important ring. This is a ring. You can prove that in fact, this is a ring. And this is the ring of integers. 
And moreover, this is a local ring with a unique maximal ID, or this is the definition of local ring with a unique maximal ID, and we can explicitly uh, describe which one is this maximal idea and the maximum idea are just the elements with uh, positive valuation. So the valuation is bigger than zero. So you see that this is the, exactly what happens in the case of periodic numbers, but we are doing this in general. So rigorous valuation. And then we define the residue field exactly as the ring of integers mod the unique maximal idea. So this is a field. In the general situation, this field may be of any characteristic, meaning maybe characteristic zero, maybe characteristic P positive. So uh, this is the general situation. So we define a valuation field K is a field with a valuation. So it's a, a valuation field. And then uh, by the definition of evaluation that I made, we see that this evaluation is always non-Archimedean and this uh, medium told us what is this non-Archimedean situation once we understand the absolute value or, or uh, we can define it also with valuations explicitly, but uh, this is an ultramatic field, so we call it like that. Okay, so now that we have evaluation and we have a topology, you know, that we can complete, we can take the completion and then this completion is exactly in the sense as Miriam defined us today in the morning, but just for this field. So this is the completion respect to the evaluation. And then uh, there are some important elements here. So I can take a pi and okay, oops, if I take pi different from zero with valuation non-zero, we can now consider this projective limit. So I can consider the idea generated by the powers of, of pi, of the, sorry, the, the set of ideals, so the principal ideal generated by the power of p, and then consider the projective limit. And then uh, this projective limit, I call it the completion, right? And the, 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 it is the profinite complete, is not the profinite, the, the completion of this, of this, uh, the ring, okay that we call OK hat. And then uh, it turns out to be a domain, an integral domain. Then I can consider the fraction field. And then uh, the good thing is when I consider the fraction field, I, I recover exactly the completion of my field. So this is a, a, very, good, a very good thing. So showing in other words that this, these topologies are kind of the same of compatible the same topologies because one is using these uh, projective systems and the other is with evaluation that give you and then you can see this with the periodic numbers as, as i said this exercise that i that i give before for the periodic numbers is exactly this situation once we understand the periodic numbers as a fraction fields of the periodic integers and the periodic integers we have a topology with as a projective limit, but also we have in the periodic rational numbers this topology given by devaluation, and then we have this isomorphism, or we have that they are the same. So this is a little bit more general than this situation. And then uh, once again, we can construct this this field the completion as just inverting pi in all of these elements. And then in this construction, we choose some pi, but then uh, you can prove that this construction does not depend on the choice of, of this element pi. So the properties of pi should be that the evaluation is different from zero and pi is not zero, of course, uh, an element of the ring of integers of k. Okay. So you change pi, you can prove that this construction gives you the same or isomorphic or canonical isomorphic constructions. Okay. So <laughs> we have this uh, definition. So a field which is complete respect evaluation is called a complete non-Archimedean field. Okay? And sometimes uh, this is also some matter of definitions you will find in, in some authors call it a non-Archimedean field. By definition, a non-Archimedean field is already a complete field. But uh, some other authors, for instance, Jean-Marc Fontaine call it uh, 
call it a, a, a complete, uh, this is the definition of Fontaine, a field complete with respect to evaluation is called a complete non artemian field. So he used this notion of complete non artemian field because he lets the possibility of considering non artemian fields which are not complete. So just with a non artemian measure value. With a lot of people just um, do this definition non artemian field, they are assuming already that this is complete. But it doesn't matter. I just, I just mentioned it here. So if, if we need it to be complete, we call it complete non Archimedean field. Otherwise, we just call it non Archimedean field. And then uh, we have an exercise. If K be a complete non Archimedean field with respect to evaluation B, and we let K prime an algebraic extension of my, my field, then and there is a unique valuation V prime that, that extends to this uh, valuation B and the valuation V prime and K, K prime, such that when we, uh, meaning that, that this is an extension, the definition to be an extension meaning is, is that uh, when we evaluate this valuation in, in the points of, of the field K, we get an equality, right? So, uh, there is so this exercise saying that there is a unique way to extend the evaluation to an, an algebraic extension. Okay. And then, uh, then we have that this uh, extension is complete if and only if the extension is finite. So this is very important because when we consider this is uh, exactly in the same uh, mood uh, as the question before, uh, that that someone did yesterday. So that when I consider finite extensions, we get complete, uh, complete, um, I mean, I can, I can, I, I get already complete extensions. But if I consider the algebraic closure, it may not be complete, right? So in fact, it, it is not complete because of this proposition. It is complete if and only if the extension is finite. And that's why we need to complete already. So. Okay, we need to complete when we get got. So I take QP, the periodic rational, this is complete. But when I go to the algebraic closure, this is not complete because this is not an, a finite algebraic extension. However, the finite algebraic extension, they are complete. The finite algebraic extension are complete. Uh, and then when I consider the algebraic closure, I need to complete once again, okay, to get the periodic complex number. Okay, and then if uh, I take uh, alpha and alpha prime, I, I call it F prime, but it should be K. K prime here. K prime. Our conjugate elements in, in, in K prime, then the valuations in these elements are exactly the same. So this is A and A prime. So much better. So this is a and A prime are conjugate element, then the, the valuation on these elements are exactly the same. So it is something that always happens also. And then finally, uh, I can do this definition of a local field. So a local field is a complete discrete valuation field. And then here I have to say what's discrete because I haven't said before. So discrete is just that the valuation is uh, as a subgroup of the valuation group, which is the image just of the valuation of the, of the field. Uh, it's a subgroup of the reals and of the real numbers. And then as a subgroup of the real numbers, this is a, a, a discrete, or it's a discrete set, a discrete topological space. Okay, then uh, whose residue field is a perfect of characteristic P. So a local field is a complete discrete valuation field whose residue field is a perfect field of characteristic P, so positive characteristics. So this is what we mean by a local field. So now finally, what's a periodic field? And then this is a, this is a, they say now that I read it that they, this is a modern definition of periodic field because uh, a lot of authors call periodic field just finite extension of QP, and we are going to see why in a second. But this definition is a little bit more general, and, and I am going to say also why I think this is the reason. 
of extending this definition. So a periodic field is a local field of characteristic zero, just like that. So the periodic field is a local field of characteristic zero. So you see that uh, uh, periodic numbers or periodic rational numbers are periodic fields yeah, because they are local fields of characteristic zero with residue field of characteristic P. Uh, but uh, one of the characteristics that we have in periodic numbers is that the residue fields are finite fields. And in this definition of periodic field, we are letting this possibility open. So we may have, we may have uh, periodic fields with residue field, residue field non-finite, so infinite, infinite fields. So this is the extension really. So this fact is that, or this note is that the only periodic fields with residue fields is finite are exactly the old periodic say, field. So, so the, the finite extension of QP. And then um, you will see, I guess, with Genaro that um, when you take the maximum ramified extension of QP, uh, this is, um, this is a, an infinite extension of QP whose residue field is precisely the algebraic closure of the, of the finite field of the residue field of QP of the finite field FP. And then in this sense, this is a complete field. So this is a periodic field in with this definition. It's not a periodic field in the old definition, but this is a periodic field with this definition. So it is convenient to extend these definitions for periodic field. So these are uh, this uh, all these kind of fields, the the maximum ramified extension and the and the tame and all these uh, fields that we construct in algebraic number theory uh, are very important in this theory of periodic and eleatic representations. And then we want to include them, at least in the periodic case, as periodic fields. Okay. So when, when, we, when we have these conditions. Okay. So let K be uh, C, yes. Um, so you are saying the definition of local field evaluation is non-trivial. Uh, um, I said before that I'm going to consider in general this non-trivial uh, situation. I'm, I'm considering the, the evaluation non-trivial evaluations. So in, in what I'm doing now, we are considering this non-trivial, but in fact, you can wonder what happens in the trivial when you consider the trivial situation. And then this is a, a good, Exercise. What, what is happening when you consider a 3D evaluation? What do you get? So this is an interesting question that maybe we can discuss later. Okay. Okay. So this is a question in the chat. Yeah. So let K be a local field with a normalized valuation, and then a normalized valuation. The thing is that uh, equivalent valuations and what two, two valuations are equivalent if they define the same topology in this space. It turns out that the equivalent valuations can be, uh, are, well, I mean, if I, if I modify a valuation just by multiplying by a, by a real number, I get an equivalent valuation. And we can prove that all equivalent valuations are of this form. So we're just modifying one from other just by multiplication of a real number. So and, uh, that means that if I modify a valuation by multiplication of a real number, I don't change the topology of my field. I change the valuation, but not the topology of my field. And that let me choose a particular valuation, which is called the normalized valuation. And then the normalized valuation is that there exists basically an element with valuation equal to one. So just by modifying, by a multiplication of a real number, we can modify my valuation in order to get a normalized valuation. And then this is equivalent to say that the valuation group is now the integers. So let K be a local field with normalized valuation, the integers, and um, perfect residue field, okay, K. And we, we assume that the characteristic of K is, is P bigger than zero. Then now you choose pi a uniformizer of K. So a uniformizer of, of, of K is an element with valuation one exactly, right? Okay, uh, which is the same as, as uh, saying that this element is one of the generators of the maximal ideal with valuation one. Then we have uh, uh, this isomorphism. So we have that the 
ring of integers of k is just the projective limit of uh, of, uh, of these rings, the quotient of these rings. And then this is very interesting because in particular, this will let me write the elements of o of OK as, uh, as sums. I mean, this is the general situation and, and this is telling me that it's, this is very similar on what happens with static numbers. So with static numbers, we have these situations and we are saying what with local fields, uh, at least with these conditions, it happened also this isomorphism. And then this is important because uh, we can endow this with the discrete topology as before. And then we have uh, now the profinite, we have the topology, the cool topology defining in here. And then here I have the topology of the, of the evaluation. And then what we get that is that this isomorphism is not only an isomorphism of, of rings, of topological, but, but this is an isomorphism of topological rings, meaning that, that this is also an homeomorphism. So that topologies are basically the same. We have an homeomorphism between these two constructions. So uh, one with the crude topology and the other with the topology induced by, by the evaluation. So what happens with periodic numbers. Okay. Uh, in, and therefore we can deduce from this, from this uh, isomorphism that the local field K is locally compact if and only if the residue field is a finite, because in this case we have a, the crude topology is a profinite, give me a profinite uh, construction as, as we did before. And we see that, that in this case with profinite sets, profinite groups of profinite rings, uh, the topology is locally compact. And, and in fact, we can see that the ring OK is compact and then uh, and totally disconnected also, of course. And then an important situation of this is the time. Just to finish, let me finish this sentence. So let's be a set of representatives of my, of my um, field. Then every element can be written as, uh, as a sum, as in the periodic numbers of these representatives uh, times a power of the, of the uniformizer. So exactly as in the periodic numbers. I don't remember if with medium, you see that periodic numbers can be constructed as a sum of, sum of powers of P. But in any case, uh, we are seeing that, uh, that we can do it uh, for, this, uh, for this kind of fields, which are in which periodic numbers are a particular, a particular situation. It will be very important uh, for the constructions that uh, we are doing later of these fontaine rings and also for these tech newly representatives that I guess I'm going to define tomorrow because now I don't have time.